So, further signs of the uh, cognitive revolution. Left off with representational art. Take a look at religion, commercial systems, and uh, fixed social hierarchies. It's signs of um, religion. You see a skeleton of a man uh, who was buried in what is now Bulgaria, probably over 6,000 years ago. So it's not from the same era as the Cognitive Revolution, but it gives you a kind of a, a sense of things. Advancements in purposeful burial are one of the key signs of the Cognitive Revolution. At a certain point in the past, our ancestors decided that they didn't just want to leave a dead body lying on the ground. They wanted to care for the dead. And this was something that actually predated the Cognitive Revolution, the very basic practices of moving bodies or placing them in particular uh, locations, doing things like that. But it was really around the time of the Cognitive Revolution that we saw this kind of organized approach to this, including the practice of burial. And it's fortunate that they did this because that's something that you can um, tap into in the past. They probably also cremated bodies, but of course, doesn't leave the same kind of evidence behind. So it's around this time that you see the development of cemeteries, as we would understand them, and also burying people with grave goods. That basically just means stuff that's included in a grave site, such as gold, right? What else do you need when you're dead except gold and more gold, right? Or beaker pots, right? Or whatever it might be. Stuff that kind of hints at this idea of a belief in an afterlife. The notion that uh, this person who died will need this stuff, or there's a kind of tribute that's attached to it, something along those lines. It does a uh, gesture in the direction of religious beliefs developing around this time. And so it's been said that ever since the time that we were thinking of as uh, people, as humans, we've had some form of religion. Now, we don't really know what the religious beliefs would have been at this time, because again, they didn't write anything down, but there's this hint that they were starting to think in this way. So the emergence of religion around uh, this time, which, as I say, is mostly traceable to looking at uh, grave sites from this uh, period. Commercial systems, meaning uh, systems of exchange, barter, things like that. Fixed social hierarchies. Animals arrange themselves into hierarchies. They jockey with each other for position. But that's a kind of fluid, ongoing process with them. Fixed social hierarchies. That's more of a kind of a human thing. Think about uh, hereditary systems of succession, like a royal family. That's a fixed social hierarchy. Because who becomes the next leader? Who becomes the next king? The prince, the son of the king. So it's a kind of a social hierarchy that extends across multiple generations. That's traceable to this period as well. Probably the biggest one, but also the one that's um, very difficult to uh, trace, the development of uh, language as we understand it. Um, it's difficult to trace, again, because this predates recorded history, so we don't have the record of language, but some have speculated that this is basically what it was all about. The cognitive revolution represents a uh, period in which our ancestors started speaking language as we understand language today. Now, keep in mind, animals Animals use vocalizations all the time, right? They use vocalizations to communicate how they feel about something. Again, if you have a cat, your cat can use vocalizations to tell you that it wants something or it can tell you how it feels about something, but most of those vocalizations proceed on quite a basic level. Contrast that to human vocalizations, which are very in-depth and complex. Painting of the Tower of uh, Babel, um, that uh, this is part of a, a religious explanation as to why we speak different languages, because that's one of the sorts of uh, conundrums that takes us back into the history of humanity. Why do we have so many different uh, languages when it would be convenient if we all just spoke the same language so we could communicate across uh, borders? Tower of Babel gives one explanation as to uh, why that is uh, the case. The cognitive revolution example um, gives us a different uh, explanation, basically says, well, language is developed in different places, different regions, and in some cases, independently of one another. Some of them belong to the same branches, the same families. Others are just totally radically different. But needless to say, there's a variety, a diversity of uh, different uh, languages. And the other one, extinctions and uh, more extinctions. This is right around the time where humans developed a kind of antisocial knack for causing extinctions, for killing off other animals. That wasn't the kind of thing that we'd been doing previously. Now, it can be the case that other animals hunt out other animals. 
I mean, that can certainly happen, a kind of inadvertent process. But for us, there was this transition where we went through this uh, process of developing certain abilities of cognition, and then wherever we went uh, subsequently, we note some uh, quite drastic drops in uh, biodiversity, especially among uh, megafauna. That just means large animals, uh, elephants and giraffes. Those are megafauna. So after we went through the cognitive revolution, we started these migratory processes, went to different uh, places, and the black arrows represent uh, human arrivals. And note these kind of declines in the populations of large animals in Australia, North America, Madagascar as well. Suddenly we're just killing off all of these animals around us. Uh, Africa at the top, Africa is the exception that proves the rule because human life started in Africa. So you never had this kind of big wave of Homo sapiens entering the African continent. They were already there integrated into the local uh, ecosystems. Australia is really that kind of telling case in point, very rudimentary chart. Of course, the um, uh, sort of orange line gives you a sense of the arrival of humans in the range of 55,000 years ago. And note that when we get to 40,000 years, suddenly we see this um, a big drop where you have a lot of extinction events occurring. One of the very important uh, points here, that this occurred long before anything resembling modern society existed. So we talk today about extinction events um, and endangered species and all sorts of things we can point to, deforestation, uh, pollution, wide variety of different things. There's no civilization as such at this time, nothing in the way of technology or infrastructure or society. We're hunter-gatherer people at this time. We follow animals around, hunting them. Nonetheless, it is just our presence, our proximity to animals, which seems to cause the deaths of these animals around us. And you'd have to speculate kind of an inadvertent process. We're not even trying to do it. It's just something that we do. Part of that, of course, was thanks to the cognitive revolution, thanks to the development of our language abilities, it gives us an enormous advantage over all other species. Our level of coordination, cooperation, turned us into something that um, we're not even just apex predators. Apex predator means just at the top of the uh, food chain, at the top of a, a pyramid of predation. It's almost like we're these external forces to the natural world. We're not really of nature anymore. We kind of act on nature instead of really being a fundamental integrated part of it. We trace that long before the era of civilization and uh, culture, and we can certainly uh, trace this to the era of the cognitive revolution. Obviously kind of a shame as far as Australia goes, as far as a lot of places go, because uh, a whole slew of very impressive and interesting animals went extinct in the past. You can see the uh, Prokoptodon, which is a kind of a large kangaroo, actually looks like a giant rabbit of sorts, which was native to um, Australia, and Megalania, which was a, um, a giant a lizard as well. Australia still has plenty of wildlife today, but it lost some of its just giant, impressive dinosaur-like um, animals. And there are various others as well, giant turtles and snakes that went extinct in the range of 50,000 years ago in um, Australia, right around the time that humans arrived. <coughs> Famous dodo bird, this is a case study in this uh, propensity of humans to cause uh, extinction events. I believe this was the first time it was ever recorded and commented on that we have the uh, capacity, the propensity to do this. If it were not the case, then the dodo bird would probably be completely forgotten to uh, history, but uh, since it was commented on, this kind of preserved the legacy of this animal. You see the dodo bird, a kind of large, ungainly, flightless uh, bird that was native to the island of uh, Mauritius. And the dodo went extinct in the 1600s, about a century after its first contact with humanity, because there was nobody on the island of Mauritius prior to this. So humans start to arrive. And then about 100 years later, the dodo bird is gone. And there was an um, explorer, a scientist, I think it was a Dutch scientist, who was the first person to comment on that and say, wait a minute, I think we caused this to happen. That's the reason why this animal is extinct. It is due to our presence. And again, probably an inadvertent thing. 
there isn't really kind of any evidence that we were really valuing the dodo bird as a, a delicacy to eat or there was really any reason for us to kill it. No, we just did by virtue of uh, being there. It's been part of the history of humanity. And now, of course, in the present day, we're trying our best to manage and curb that because we're increasingly aware of the impact that we have on other species and animals around us. Negative impact, not for all of them, but for a sizable number of them. So we've looked at the um, signs and symptoms of the cognitive revolution, given evidence of it occurring. What exactly uh, was this anyway? As the name implies, when you speak about cognition, you're referring to thinking and subjectivity. And I think that that's very apt because, as I mentioned uh, previously, the biological structure of humanity was in place and then our behavior changes. So it's sort of as though we were suddenly thinking in a much different way than we had been previously. We started thinking in uh, the human sense. But how do we get to the kind of the um, essence of this question? And it's a big question. It's a kind of philosophical question because here we're really looking for the essence of humanity. Again, we go on the assumption that we're separate from other animals, that we're not the same as other animal species. Okay, so what is it that defines that separation? What is it really that is making us a different kind of uh, being? And this is exactly what scientists and philosophers have been grappling with for a very long time. Aristotle, ancient Greek philosopher, uh, one of the um, foundational members of the Western philosophical tradition, referred to humanity as a, quote, a rational animal, which is one definition. Basically says humans have higher reasoning skills. That's a definition that's often thrown about. Animals don't have those kinds of reasoning skills. It gets a little bit vague when we try to define what exactly that means. We're not really sure because we know that animals do use reason. They do use logic, but there's this kind of idea that our thinking is more, what, abstract or representative or whatever it might be, except we don't really know the way animals think. We're just kind of working on a basis of a series of assumptions. There are other ways we can think about that. I mentioned before the development of tools as something that separates us. Yes, certain complex, fine tools, but animals use tools in their own basic rudimentary way, I would say. Um, abstract reason, I mentioned. Uh, language as well. Human language definitely seems to be different, although animals, as I said, they use vocalizations. They certainly can communicate with one another. They can communicate with us as well. In-depth emotions, that's something else that's often been cited. Although it seems that animals do have emotions, maybe not the same kinds of emotions that we have, but they're certainly capable of feeling things. So none of these explanations, I think, really uh, get to the heart of this um, essential quality to humanity, whatever it is that actually defines us as a separate species or a separate being. I say there the third point. Maybe we should be thinking uh, less about uh, quality than uh, quantity. And there's an important difference when you talk about the quality of something, then you can be referring to the essence or this single important thing. Quantity just means the amount of something. So if you have more of a quantity, it just means you have more of something. And perhaps quantity is um, of central importance here. Again, this is just one theory. I don't want to present it as being conclusive, but just one idea to perhaps um, turn over. What does that mean, quantity? Well, the cognitive revolution may have involved the development of an ability to store, process, transmit, and communicate enormous amounts of information. And I like that as a definition because there you're really dealing with the amount of something. It's the amount of information, not something essential. Because as I say there, all animals store, process, transmit, and communicate information. They all have to kind of navigate their environments, gather information about their environments. Information there, it just means gathering stuff, gathering data, becoming aware of your surroundings, perceiving whatever's around it. They're all doing that, but perhaps not at the same level of complexity and detail as humans, that our information gathering capacities are working at uh, such a kind of higher level in terms of sheer quantity. Give an example of this. Consider that one of our languages, English, contains over 170,000 words. Use language to convey information. That's what I'm doing right now, speaking to you, Commun conveying, communicating information. Now, 
an average English speaker has a vocabulary of around 20,000 words, and there could be as many as 7,000 active languages in uh, the world today. So there's a lot of kind of information uh, communication abilities among humans. Think about that as a contrast to um, the languages of animals. Again, they use vocalizations, but not as many as these. Right? They have a series of kind of uh, things that they say or things that they can convey and communicate, quite a limited number to just convey how they feel about something or an immediate situation. Not only that, but it is not as though there are only 170,000 things we can say. No, because we're arranging these words into different combinations and uh, different patterns. How many things can we actually say? I mean, you stop and think about it for a moment, is there any limit to the number of things that we can say? Think of all the books that have been written across human history, all the different arrangements and combinations of words that we have formed in the thousands upon thousands of books, the thousands of records that we've kept about things, all the conversations that we've had over time. All we're doing there is conveying and communicating information. And have we come close to exhausting the amount of things that we can say, the amount of things that we can write. No, we haven't even scraped the surface in terms of the amount of things that we can communicate. So if you're interested in writing and you're worried that uh, somebody has already said there, everything that there is to say, don't worry about it, right? Because it's not true. There's no limit to the things that we can communicate and say. You sense here of a uh, difference in these uh, informational capacities. There's a cat, my cat, um, Nori, looking uh, hyper. Imagine that you have a cat and you place that cat into uh, an unfamiliar environment, a space that's never been in before, like an apartment or something like that. What does the cat do in that situation? Well, assuming your cat is not too scared or anything like that, what it will probably do is wander around the space from room to room. Why is the cat doing that? Because it is gathering information about its environment. It is very curious to see what is in this space, whether there are other people or other animals here, whether there are food or water sources, whether there are threats. It wants to get a sense of the dimensions of the space that it's in. Simple information gathering practice. When you visit a new place for the first time, like a city, you would probably behave in a similar way to the cat. You might go out on the streets and walk around. You're doing the same basic thing. You're gathering information about your environment. You're seeing what's there, what the space looks like. Maybe, yeah, food, water sources, restaurants or cafes you might go to. Maybe even looking for potential threats, things like that. If that cat encounters another cat within its space, then there probably will be an exchange between them. They will show each other how they feel about one another's presence. Probably annoy, right, would be the kind of typical response of two cats. You can bet there will be a kind of communication between them on a basic level. Vocalizations and body language. They're exchanging information with each other. So too, if you meet someone when you're in the new city for the first time, and assuming you speak the same language, you could have an exchange with that person. You could sit down and talk to that person. Ah, but think of the level of depth and complexity of your exchange with another person. You could, if you wanted to, sit down with that person for hours, for days, and you could just talk to them. But all this stuff that's happened to you in your life, all your different ideas and opinions about things, all the films you've seen, all the books you've read, everything that's interesting to you, you probably wouldn't want to do that, right? But you could do it. And the level of information that you could exchange with each other would reach an extraordinary level of depth and complexity. So too with doing something like keeping a diary. I mean, you could fill hundreds of pages, thousands of pages, just writing down everything that's happened to you today. Dreams you had, the thoughts you had, what you did in the morning, what you did in the afternoon. I don't know if anyone would want to read it, right? But you could nonetheless do that. You could stockpile a huge amount of information, just descriptions of yourself and your environment. As I said, are there any limits to this, really? Are there any limits to this ability that we have? Perhaps not. 
Imagine that we could travel around to other star systems, that we could travel around potentially to other galaxies. We can't, probably not, which is an unfortunate thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the class. But imagine we had interstellar technology, so we could visit other planets. If we were on other planets, we could certainly gather information about those environments. We could certainly talk about the stuff that we're seeing in that space because it's just flexible and malleable. Our information transmitting processing and communication abilities might be functionally infinite. In other words, there might actually be no limit to the things that we can see and represent and exchange. And that is something that speaks to this idea of uh, quantity. You might not think that just a difference in quantity would make such a large uh, difference in terms of um, who we are as a species, but it might make all the difference. That might be the most significant thing about us at all, just this idea of us being connected to the infinite through language, also through numbers as well. Mathematics, numbers are functionally infinite. And that's why I say you might think of one definition, just one definition. There are so many others we could put out there. But here's one definition. Humanity is a finite being connected to the infinite. Finite meaning uh, limited, limited in extent and uh, duration. And that is certainly true of all of us and it's probably true of everything else as well. We're all mortal beings, right? And fortunately or unfortunately, we're only gonna be here for a short length of time. Humanity itself, as I've been talking about here, is a finite species. We have not been around forever. There's a kind of duration to our lifespan and sorry to say we won't be around forever. We're not gonna last forever either. The Earth, the planet that we're standing on right now, is finite. It's been around for 4.6 billion years, and it's not going to last forever. Some point in the future, the sun is going to swallow it. That's about 5 billion years from now. In fact, cosmology even tells us that the universe is finite, that it emerged at a moment 13.8 billion years ago. So if you start to worry about your mortality, your limited allotment of years, well, don't worry too much because that's the fate of everything. Right? Everything is just limited. Nothing lasts forever. And yet we're aware of the infinite, of things that just go on and on forever. As existence might, right? There might be more than just one universe, as numbers do. Mathematics tells us that. Numbers are infinite. There's no end to numbers, as so too language can be considered infinite if you think of all the different combinations that we could put our words into. So that's one way of thinking about us as, again, animals doing the same things that animals do, because I think basically that's what we're doing, but really on a kind of different plane of existence, curiously different from the rest of the natural world. So in the time remaining, just want to introduce uh, something about the agricultural revolution, which is another one of those uh, prehistorical revolutions that comes uh, uh, much later. We date this roughly in the range of, as I said previously, uh, 10,000 uh, years ago. So we went through the cognitive revolution. Again, 50,000 years is a rough estimate. But we have tens of thousands of years where we're living as humans, but living predominantly as hunter-gatherers, basically meaning that we uh, are always on the move, migrating, and typically following other animals around. Uh, that would be part of our basic lifestyle. Things changed. Um, again, it happens in select places initially, and then kind of spread slowly across the world. But I'll point out there are still hunter-gatherer societies to this day. So that just goes to uh, give that indication that not everybody has to experience these kinds of transformative revolutions. The exception being the cognitive revolution. I think it's safe to say every human has experienced the cognitive revolution. About 10,000 years ago, humans who had previously lived a nomadic foraging lifestyle as hunter-gatherers began settling down more, remaining in single locations for extended uh, periods. This trend began in regions that correspond to modern-day Turkey and Iran, but also developed independently in other places all over the world. So this was a shift to a kind of more um, sedentary lifestyle. And if you want to date uh, the time for the development of settlements, towns and later on cities, you can basically date it to this period. 
It had everything to do with sustenance, with the uh, food that we were eating. Previously, we had gra- gathered crops and uh, hunted animals. Well, we were still doing that, but we began raising animals and planting crops that we deemed uh, useful to us. And this gives you an example of some of what happened at this time. Wheat, goats, and sheep were domesticated about 11,000 years ago. Dogs were in there as well. Peas, lentils, cows, pigs, maize, corn, that's what maize is, and eventually horses followed thereafter. All very familiar crops and animals to us. It seems as though at a certain point our ancestors reached an important uh, insight. They realized that there are a limited number of crops and animals that are really useful to us. That a lot of animals might be threats to us, or they're pests, or they're just ignorable. We don't pay any attention to them. So we're basically looking for a select number of animals that we have decided are useful to us. And so too with our crops, we've decided, well, these things, there's only kind of a select number of things that are really useful to us. And so they reach this uh, particular insight. Why don't we just grow this stuff ourselves? instead of always looking for it. So too with animals. Why are we constantly hunting goats down, hunting sheep down? Why don't we just create a pen and raise the animals ourselves? We know how to control them. We can domesticate them. And so that's effectively what they started to do. Transition to a more sedentary lifestyle. Because with this, you don't have to keep moving all the time, looking for new things, looking for new things. No, you're just in one location, raising the animals, growing the crops, get to settle down a little bit more. And this is, as I say, where you see the development of these uh, settlements starting uh, to spring up. In his 2011 best-selling book, Sapiens, which is a a very interesting book about some of the early developments in human history, Um, Yuval Noah Harari refers to the agricultural revolution as, uh, quote, history's the biggest fraud, which I like that as a kind of very uh, strong uh, statement. He says that because his basic argument is that the agricultural revolution was not good for our health and was not good for us as a species. Why not? Well, for starters, it made us more sedentary, meaning we were kind of based in single locations. And there's this idea of staying in motion, staying on the go is a better thing to do. But he also makes the claim that it seriously narrowed and restricted our diets, that it would have been better if we had just kept on finding all sorts of different foods because that diverse diet would have allowed us to stay stronger, more robust, and healthier. But this was, as Harari sees it, a precursor to this idea of just living off of a single uh, series of staple crops. I say, in truth, it is difficult, if not impossible, to apply such blanket value judgments to history. It's really hard to say whether something like the agricultural revolution was good for us or bad for us. And I think we can say the same thing about all of these subsequent revolutions that have occurred. The industrial revolution, was that a good or a bad thing? Well, it's poisoning and destroying the environment. I mean, that much seems clear today with uh, industry. And yet, if it were not for the Industrial Revolution, the overwhelming majority of people would still be living as peasants. I mean, we probably all would be right now. Industry kind of changed the entire structure of humanity. So too with the digital revolution that we're um, living through right now at, at this moment in time. Unlike, I think, the majority of you, maybe not all of you, but probably the majority, I can remember a time before the internet. And someone could ask me, or better still, ask someone who's even older than me, who can remember that longer period of time, um, was life better or worse before the internet? Has the internet, has all this digitization technology, has that been a good or a bad thing for people, for humanity as a whole? I don't know. Honestly, I can't tell you if it's a good or a bad thing. It's certainly different. It's made a change. But, I mean, you can look at it from different sides. You can say, well, all of this technology has allowed us to do incredible things, wonderful things. But on the other hand, you could fill an entire library full of uh, books talking about the negative impact of social media, the negative impact of digitization, the dumbing down of culture, all of these things that have occurred, and the potential threats of artificial intelligence in the future. So it's just hard to just kind of land on one point or the other and saying, yeah, it was great, or sorry, it was terrible. 
can see what the agricultural revolution has done over time. There you see the transformation of the biosphere over the past um, 8,000 years since basically the time of the agricultural revolution. And one thing that stands out about this is that you have a, a decline in the total amount of wildlands that exist, basically means wild, untamed land and territory, which has been uh, shrinking steadily over time. You have the uh, semi-natural, basically refers to grasslands and things like that, and fields, which has also been shrinking. And in the meantime, our kind of personally modified habitats have been expanding in size. You have densely settled uh, areas, basically refers to uh, cities and towns, which no, don't take up a huge amount of uh, land on the planet Earth. We're used to thinking of kind of cities and towns as sort of, you know, taking over all the land. That's because we live in those places, so they kind of encompass our entire world. But when you get down to it, cities and towns, they don't take up a huge amount of land. So what's all the land being used for? Well, croplands and rangelands, as far as we're concerned. And that is entirely due to our own intervention into the environment. Croplands basically refers to farmland where we are planting a variety of crops and what kind of crops? Well, the same stuff, actually, right? Peas, lentils, maize, corn, wheat, right? It's, it's the same kind of stuff that we've been domesticating for a very long time. That's what we're growing today, same as in the past. And rangelands as well, basically uh, areas where other animals live, but these are animals that we ourselves are raising. So they're not necessarily wild animals, but there are a lot of uh, these animals. Again, we have our goats, our sheep, our cows, pigs, whatever it might be, all basically occupying these different areas. So we've certainly had an impact on the, um, the structure of the land on the planet Earth since the time of the agricultural revolution. We've kind of altered the basic uh, makeup of it, as it were. There you see an image courtesy of Nash, NASA showing a photosynthesis, that just is plants taking energy from the sun during the peak of North America's uh, growing season. The glow is produced by the vast cornfields across America and uh, Canada. That's what that kind of infrared glow represents. At its peak, the product productivity of this region, which contains essentially one crop, is 40% higher than the Amazon rainforest, which is an utterly bizarre thing to consider because we often have this idea that, yeah, thanks to all of um, human civilization, thanks to our presence on the planet, we're basically destroying all plant life, all crop life, that we're making everything synthetic and artificial. That we're just paving everything over with cement. We have our giant factories and dams and cities, etc. Well, it's not quite the case. There's just as much plant life as there ever was before. And in fact, in some cases, more so. I mean, there's an enormous amount of plant life just in North America right there, more so than in the Amazon rainforest. Yeah, but it's all the same kind of plant. That's the key point, right? It's just corn, rows and rows of corn. And that's become the kind of the structure of our planet in the wake of the agricultural revolution. You have endless tracts of land where you have the same crop, the same plant, over and over and over again. Whether it's corn, whether it's wheat, whether it's um, any one of a number of different things, soybeans, for instance, coffee, whatever it might be, whatever is uh, profitable to us. So too with animals as well. I mean, again, you have this idea, well, the human presence, it surely must be driving this uh, total drop in the animal uh, population. We're gonna take a look at what we actually mean when we say the animal population. But in reality, there are a ton of animals on our planet right now. But um, you might note in certain regions and areas, it looks like a lot of the same animal over and over again. There you see a map from 2007 showing population density of animals uh, by U.S. Uh, county. I don't have one from Britain, so I'm using an American one. The pink represents uh, cows, which range anywhere from three or four uh, to uh, per square mile. 
to 700 per square mile, so depending on the level of uh, density, and the total estimate is of 96 million cows. However, chickens represented by blue top them all at two uh, billion. There's less blue on the map because chickens uh, take up uh, less space. I'm not sure how many chickens total on our planet right now, but it's an astronomical number. And again, it's a lot of the same animal over and over again. Chickens, for instance, are an unbelievable evolutionary success story. Talk about an animal that is maybe not living super well, but nonetheless their numbers are flourishing in the billions and billions to this day. And why? Is it because chickens survive exceptionally well in the wild? Because chickens are apex predators? No, it's because we have decided they're useful. That's the reason. That is the only reason. So too with the number of cows. It's not because cows are great survivors in the wild or we'd have this cornucopia of this animal in a natural environment. No, exclusively because we've decided that these animals are useful to us. And thus, you see a lot of this kind of sameness, this kind of monoculture sort of taking over the planet. It's the legacy of the agricultural revolution, growing crops and raising animals that are useful to us and clearing out the things that are not useful to us. So too with pets as well. We talk about keeping uh, animals as uh, companions, as uh, pets. It's not a super diverse crop of animals when you get down to it. Look at the uh, percentages of uh, pet ownership for people who live in uh, 22 different countries. This is just uh, thanks to a survey. 33% dogs, 23% cats are certainly the biggest one. Again, a lot of the same animals over and over again. It's not really this kind of very diverse, heterogeneous group of different uh, species. You see the kind of estimated global biomass um, as it stands uh, right now. And one of the more fascinating things about this, we speak about the kind of the um, biodiversity of our planet. Well, there on the left, you have the total uh, biomass, living things, essentially. And note that uh, plants basically constitute the overwhelming majority of this kind of living organic matter. You also have a whole bunch of stuff like bacteria and fungi as well. And then up there in the right-hand corner, you have um, animals, which constitute quite a small part of the total uh, biomass. You expand this little bracket here to like take a look at the uh, different kinds of animals. One thing you might notice is that wild mammals don't take up a huge percentage, and neither do livestock as well. Instead, you have a whole bunch of fish and anthropods. You have these kind of small critters, which basically make up the kind of larger mass, the larger bulk of animals. So when we talk about drops in biodiversity, we are talking about kind of um, select species in a way, because this is basically the level that we operate at. But when you think about wild mammals, or when you think about different animals, you have to consider today Larger animals, well, those that thrive in close proximity to humans are the ones that are doing exceptionally well right now. There are pets that we keep, there are animals that we, we domesticate, and there's also a variety of other animals. You can think about things like um, rats and mice and pigeons and seagulls, the kinds of animals that maybe don't care so much how many cities we build because they're fine in close pro proximity to us. And that is in contrast to a lot of animals that don't flourish in close proximity to humans. Rather, we destroy their habitats or take over their space, and they go extinct when they're close to us. You see a kind of a cartoon from uh, The Simpsons spoofing this idea of the uh, food chain. You see your crazy friend never heard of the food chain, with this idea of humans just basically standing at the center of this food chain and all other animals kind of flowing uh, toward us. That might actually be sort of our impression today. Again, it speaks to that idea of humans being sort of external forces to the natural world or kind of of the animal kingdom, but not necessarily strictly uh, part of it. And I think that's crucial to think about our structures as species uh, moving forward. So that's it for today. I've uh, gone through the cognitive revolution, agricultural revolution. Uh, think about that. We'll come back next time and look at some of the uh, paradigms for next class. Enjoy the rest of the week.